Welcome to our first video in our series on cost estimation and cost behavior. In this video, we will provide you with a high-level overview of what you can expect from this series. Let us begin by looking at what we will cover in this video. First, we need to ask ourselves, why do we even care about this topic? Once we have seen the importance of cost estimation and behavior, we can start understanding the types of costs we get and how they behave to changes in activity levels. After this, we can have a look at the basic cost function. We then need to move on to understanding the steps and methods to estimate this cost function. Finally, we will have a very brief look at the learning effect. So, why do we need to know about cost behavior and cost estimation? What we need to understand here is that different costs react differently to changes in our activity level. Some costs increase at a uniform rate, while others remain completely unchanged. So other costs may increase, but at a decreasing rate. There are many ways in which a cost may behave, and we need to understand this behavior in order to accurately predict or estimate future costs. It is important to be able to predict future costs, as this may help us with our decision making, our planning and controlling our costs. So if we think about planning, if we don't know how a cost changes relative to say production levels, how will we be able to prepare our budget for the next financial period? If we can't prepare a budget, how will we be able to control our costs and ensure that they do not spiral out of control? What we also see is that numerous advances have been made to help us more accurately estimate costs. These more accurate estimates should improve our decision making, planning and control, and hopefully give us an edge over the competition. So now let us look at the major types of costs we get and how they behave. The first type of cost we get is a fixed cost. As the name implies, fixed costs do not change in total as our activity level increase. They are fixed. We can see this on the graph as our line is completely flat. However, what do we see if we look at the fixed cost per unit? Here we see that the fixed cost per unit is decreasing at a decreasing rate. Our line will approach zero, but never quite get there. So the fixed cost per unit decreases with each additional unit of activity as the cost is being spread over more units. An example of a fixed cost would be factory rental. Whether we produce one unit or 10,000 units of a product, the amount of rent we pay would not change. Now let us move on to the next type of cost we get, namely variable costs. This type of cost varies in direct proportion to the activity performed. This means that if the level of activity doubles, the total cost will also double. We also see that if no activity occurs, we do not incur any cost, so the line starts at the origin. Now if we look at the variable cost per unit, we see that it is constant and does not change. Each unit costs the same amount. An example of a variable cost would be any direct material. Each unit of production would require the same amount of materials. So as we increase production, the total direct materials used will increase in direct proportion to our output. Our next cost is our step fixed cost. These costs are fixed within certain activity levels. However, once we exceed the specified activity level, we need to incur a step increase. We can consider the example of factory rental to which we referred earlier. We could pay 10,000 Rand for rental. This factory then could have a capacity of 1 million units. What happens if we want to increase production to beyond 1 million units? We need to acquire a second factory for which we can again pay 10,000 Rand for rental. And now we have a maximum capacity of 2 million units. Each time we reach the critical activity level, we need to incur more fixed costs in order to increase production and therefore move up a step in our cost function. Our final cost we will then look at is our mixed cost. If we look at a graph, we see that these costs look similar to our variable costs, 
but instead of starting at the origin, they start partway up the y-axis. This is because this type of cost comprises both a fixed and variable element. The fixed element is represented by the intersect of the line and the y-axis. The variable element, then, is represented by the slope of the curve. If we look at the cost per unit graph, we see that it looks similar to the fixed cost per unit graph. However, instead of approaching zero, it rather approaches the variable cost per unit. Thus, the area under the dotted line represents the variable cost per unit, while the area between the solid red curve and the dotted red line represents the fixed cost per unit. This is the type of cost we are really going to be focusing on in this series, as we need to know how to split these costs. Now let us move on to the cost function. This cost function of y equals bx plus a represents a mixed cost. In this cost function, y represents the total cost incurred, b represents the variable cost per unit, and x represents the level of activity. Importantly, the term bx together represents the total variable cost. Finally, a represents the fixed cost in total. We can use parts of this cost function to represent pure variable costs and pure fixed costs. If we simply take the portion y equals bx, we have a pure variable cost function. If we only take y equals a, we have a pure fixed cost function. Now that we know what the cost function looks like, how do we go about estimating it? And we have six steps here. First, we need to identify the cost we are trying to predict. We then need to select a variety of potential cost drivers. Once we have identified both of these items, we can then start collecting our data. Next, we need to plot the data onto a graph. This will help us to visualize the data and see if it has a linear relationship. For the purposes of this series, we are going to be focusing solely on linear relationships. Once we have confirmed that we have a linear relationship, we can use one of various techniques to estimate the cost function. We will look at these various techniques on the next slide. Finally, we need to test the reliability of our cost functions to identify which cost driver or combination thereof best predicts our costs. Now let us briefly highlight our five methods to estimate costs, which is step five from the previous slide. These five methods are the engineering method, the inspection of accounts, scatter plots, the high-low method, and regression analysis. We will have a detailed look at each of these methods in later videos in the series. Finally, to conclude this video, let us have a brief look at something called the learning effect. What we basically see here is that the more we perform a task, the better we get at it and the less time it takes. Think about cooking a meal. If it is your first time cooking a meal, you take a lot of time reading the recipe multiple times and referring back to it. Perhaps you cook it a bit slower to make sure you don't burn the food. On the second attempt then, you are more familiar with the process and you know what to expect. By the 100th time you cook the meal, you know exactly what you are doing. You no longer refer to the recipe and you cook the food significantly faster than your first or second attempts. One thing to remember with learning is that it slows down each time you perform the task until you reach a point where you can't perform that task any faster. Thank you for joining us for our first video in our cost estimation and cost behavior series. In our next video, we will be looking more in depth at three methods of cost estimation, namely the engineering method, the inspection of accounts, and scatter plots. See you next time.